Welcome to our first ever Persian Shabbat, part of our Shabbat Around the World series here at Shomri Torah Synagogue. This Shabbat, we celebrate the rich culture, music, stories, and history of Persian Jews. This week happens to coincide not only with Purim, a holiday commemorating events that took place in ancient Persia. It also coincides with the Persian New Year called Noruz in Farsi which began just this past Wednesday, Eid HaShom HaMabarak, to those who celebrate. Thank you. What you just heard is a famous Persian love song, Em Shab Shabim Atabe, with words specially adjusted for this evening. In many synagogues, Kabbalat Shabbat begins with passionate love poetry, either through Song of Songs or Yadid Nefesh. This poetry represents love for God and for Shabbat, and is thought to inspire us for these next 25 hours with an open and willing heart to enter into Shabbat. We invite all of you this evening to open your hearts and let the unfamiliar, the familiar, 
the old and the new melodies that you hear pour inside. We welcome our talented guest musicians this evening who will help share some of these beautiful Persian melodies with us. There's a very rich history of Jews in Persia, and I'll just give a very brief one. I'm sure there are many people here who are much more expert in the topic, and you can talk to them after the service, but I'll just give a brief history. Um, Jewish communities have been living in the region of Persia since 721 BCE, so they are one of the oldest diaspora communities in the world. When Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon in 539 BCE, he granted all Jews personal and religious freedom and he let them return to Jerusalem. Some went to Jerusalem, some stayed in Babylon, but many, many, many of them migrated east in Persia, in what is now Iran, and other areas surrounding Iran, and have been there for thousands of years since. So from the time of Cyrus the Great until the Arab conquest, there was up and down relationships with Jews, but mostly peaceful, and Around the time of 636 CE, during the Arab conquest of, Iran, of Persia, Jews and all other minorities obtained second-class status. So while they enjoyed relative protection and limited rights, they had to pay a poll tax and had to accept Muslim rule unequivocally. Beginning at the turn of the 20th century, there was great European influence on Persia in general, but especially on Persian Jews, with the arrival of French schools, um, part of Alliance Israelite Universelle. Does anybody, is anybody familiar with Alliance? Um, my grandparents, I know, studied there, and I found French written in the notebooks of my grandmothers. The first school, AIU, Alliance School, opened in Tehran in 1898, finally granting Persian Jews the opportunity to receive a formal education for the first time in centuries. With the rise of Reza Shah Pahlavi in 1925, the condition of Persian Jews continued to improve. There was a little glitch in that improvement, though, because um, this Shah aligned himself with Hitler, and that's the time when they shared nationalism, and that's the time that Persia was changed to Iran. The, his son, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, there was an entire generation of Alliance educated Jews who joined the country's westernization and industrialization and really flourished. But as many of you know, with the Islamic Revolution of 1979, Jews became a heavy target of persecution. Many were executed as spies to Israel, property was seized, Jews disappeared. And 60,000 of the 85,000 Jews living in Iran fled the country. Today, there are the number of Jews still residing in Iran is estimated to be between 25,000 and 30,000. The rest are in the United States, Israel, and throughout Europe and other parts of the world. Again, I please encourage you to speak to more people. There's so much more nuance to that, but that's a basic history. Um, I want to thank Dr. Mo Mohsen Mohammadi, who is here today, who I'll introduce later. He'll join us later in the service. He taught me a little bit about Persian music. And a musical mode is called avaz. And a daska is a collection of various avas put together in a song. So we know in Ashkenazi service we have nusach, which is based on musical modes. So we have avas and daska. Persian music consists of three quarter tones, which you'll hear, which Western music does not have. Okay, enough of that. We just celebrated Purim on Wednesday evening, a story that commemorates the Jews of Shushan. Where is Shushan? Right. It's now Hamadan, which is where my ancestors are from, in ancient Persia. Several years ago on Purim, a Persian-style nigun came into my head, and I called it Esther's nigun. We begin our service with Lachuna Ranana, set to the melody of Esther's nigun, in honor of Purim and the Persian New Year. Please join us on page 15.
highlighting a few well-known Persian melodies, so we will not sing through all of Kabbalat Shabbat. We will take just a few moments right now in between some of these psalms so you can engage in your private prayer, and we'll come back together for Mizmor Le David. So we are on page 16, and we'll come back together for Mizmor Le David in just a few moments, the text of which you will find in your pamphlet. to invite up Mr. Mayor Bakshi and his daughter Alana Carlin along with some other members of their family. We will hear a melody that they've sung in their family for many years of Mizmor Le David. We know in, in our prayer service, in Ashkenazi prayer services, the next psalm is Psalm 29, but here we will hear Psalm 23, which you will find in your pamphlet. Elana explained to me that there were Jewish families in the ghetto of Tehran who took it upon themselves to teach melodies to young Jews so they would increase their connection to Judaism. And Mr. Mayor Bakshi, who's up here with us tonight, was once of these young Jews who learned this melody and passed it on to his family. Adonai roi lo echsar Bim ote she yar biseni Al mei menuhot ye mahaleni Nafshi yeshu el yanheni Bemagelei sedeg leman shemo Gam ki elech begel salmo Oh, 
Turn to page 21, Lachadodi. Lachadodi is a mystical poem that highlights the loving relationship between God, Jews, and Shabbat. There are many wedding and bride and groom analogies in Lachadodi, so I've chosen a very famous Persian wedding song. You may have heard it, Shah Dumad, which happens to fit beautifully with the text. If you look at some of the English translation and the Hebrew. Come, my beloved, to meet the bride. And in the last verse, Boy Shalom, come in peace, crown of your husband, with rejoicing and with cheerfulness. So we invite some of the members of our adult choir to come on up and help us sing this. The Nigun, for those of you who don't know it, the melody is very easy to pick up. So I invite you to please join. And remember, this is a wedding song, so I also invite you to please get up and dance if you feel so inspired to. Thank you. 
members of our adult choir who learned a Persian melody in such a short amount of time. Woo. Page 23. Liz Marshir la Yom HaShabbat.
Kaddish, page 24. All those in mourning or observing a yard side, please rise. It gadal viit kadash shemei raba ve'alma divra kirute ve'amlich malchute v'chayachon uv'yamechon v'chaye dechol beit Yisrael ba'gala uv'izman kariv v'imru amen. Yehei shemei raba mevarach le'alam l'almei almaya. Vit Barach, Vit Tabach, Vit Paar, Vit Romam, Vit Nase, Vit Hadar, Vit Ale, Vit Halal, Shmed Kudsha, Rihu, Leela, Minkol Birchata, Vishirata, Tush Bechata, Venechamata, Damiran Bealma, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shalama Rabba, Min Shemaya, Vechaim, Alenu Velko Israel, Vimru, Amen. Ose Shalom Bim Romav, Hu ya se shalom, alenu vel kol Israel, vimru, amen. May be seated. Part of this evening includes hearing some wonderful, meaningful, and personal stories from members of our community. So at this time, I'd like to invite up Tarana Banafsheha to share a story with us. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Cantor Jackie asked me last week to share a story with you all tonight about my experience as a Persian Jew or an Iranian Jew. First off, Persian and Iranian are both the same. I think Persian probably sounds better than Iranian as most people associate Persia with Persian cats, Persian rugs, <laughs> Persian poetry and art. Iran, however, has a more negative connotation being associated with ayatollahs, hostages and terrorism as most of us prefer to be associated with cats and even rugs, rather than ayatollahs, I prefer to be called Persian. <laughs> I thought a lot about what I would share tonight. I could talk about stories my father shared with us on how, how as a kid he got rocks thrown at him by other children because he was the only Jewish kid in his neighborhood. I could talk about stories my grandfather told my dad about how in his time Jewish homes, Jewish Iranian homes, Families would get repeatedly and openly robbed every few years, a practice which should have been a crime and even had a name, Qarat. But it was allowed and tolerated because Jews didn't have the same rights as others in Iran. I could share my own experience of anti-Semitism as a Persian Jew when I came to school one day and no one wanted to sit next to me. I found out later, somehow they had found that I was Jewish. I could also share the story of my cousin who disappeared over 20 years ago, along with 12 other Jewish young people trying to escape the country because they did not allow certain Jews to leave the country. 
Instead, in light of Shabbat, the Persian New Year, and the upcoming holiday of Passover, I'd like to share a story with a happy ending. It was the spring of 1986. Iran was in the middle of a devastating war with Iraq. I was in the fifth grade, and my family, who are all here tonight, consisting of my brother, my sister, myself, and my parents, we all lived in Tehran. Iraq had threatened to target the populated residential areas of Tehran, and several times a day, every day and every night, sirens would go off, we would lose power, Iraqi planes and missiles would shower Tehran's sky. We would run into our basements or bomb shelters if we happened to be in school, and I vaguely remember covering my ears not to hear the gut-wrenching roaring of anti-aircrafts and closing my eyes, saying my Shema, and wondering if I would be the target of the next Iraqi plane. My parents decided it was better to leave Tehran temporarily until things calmed down. My uncle had a small two-bedroom cottage on the outskirts of Tehran, so we moved to the little cottage with two other families and my grandmother totaling 15 people in a two-bedroom house to be safe until things calmed down. This temp temporary situation lasted about three months. We had electricity and water, and the adults would go out into the city once a week to buy food and other necessities. Every night, my cousins and I would go out and watch the sky fill with Iraqi planes, and as anti-aircrafts painted Tehran's sky orange, we wondered whose home is getting destroyed. As I mentioned, I, it was spring, and with spring comes Passover. I, start, I had started going to a Jewish school since third grade. Observing Passover as a Jew in Iran was a big deal. There were not many kosher markets to purchase kosher food for Passover. Jews gathered in synagogues to bake their own matzahs. Manischewitz did not exist, so our diets during the ho holiday of Passover was extremely limited, consisting mostly of rice, eggs, fruits, and vegetables. I asked my father, so this year we will not have Passover, Baba? He looked at me as if he understood my disappointment. We will figure something out, he said. Passover came. It turned out to be mo the most meaningful Passover of my life. We will have Seder at my sister's house, my father said. That afternoon, as he packed his family into our little sedan, Heading to the south of Tehran, my father kept a Jewish tradition alive. That night, we had Seder at my aunt's house, and somehow it felt as if we had our own version of Passover, defeating the pharaohs of war and destruction with courage, strength, and hope. Persian Jews have many such stories, stories of tenacity, hope, and resilience. Many of these stories are sad and some are happy, but all are meaningful. So next time you meet a Persian Jew, I hope that you'll ask them to share a story with you. Shabbat Shalom. And that beautiful story takes us into our Ma'ariv service. We rise and turn to page 28 for Persian Baruch Hu.
la 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 invite up some of the young leaders in our community to lead us in the Shema and Ve'ahavta on page 30, Jake, Eva, Ben Avsheha, and Zachary and Ryan Kassbaum. Turn to page 32. In just a moment, we'll join together in the middle of page 32, the Persian Micha Mocha. You can also find the Persian text in Farsi and a transliteration for Micha Mocha inside your pamphlet. I was told there was a typo. Is that true? Yes, it's written the wrong way, but if you read Farsi, you'll understand that anyway. So <laughs> we'd like to invite our adult choir to come back up and help us in singing Micha Mocha. Michamocha is one of my favorite prayers of our Shabbat and other liturgy because it commemorates a miraculous moment where the Israelites had just witnessed a wonderful miracle. But I also think that I feel Miriam and I feel her song and her spirit 
in this prayer. So I invite you to please join me in this melody. It's a responsive melody, so you'll just echo, and the, the choir will help you. We'll just echo back and forth to start, and then we will continue with the text. Mi chamocha, mi chamocha,
As we turn to page 33 for Hushki Venu, I'd like to invite up a special guest this evening who will be joining us on the setar. Dr. Mohsen Mohammadi is visiting us from, come on up, yes, um, is a professor of ethnomusicology and teaches music at UCLA, is a professor of music at UCLA. And I'm very grateful um, to, to Dr. Mohammadi because, um, he, as I mentioned before, he taught me a little bit about Persian modes of music. And we're so honored to have you joining us on this next beautiful melody, which I'll talk about for just a moment. There is a famous Persian Jewish composer. There was a, a very famous Persian Jewish composer, Morteza Nedavud, who was, anybody here familiar with Morteza Nedavud? Um, celebrated Persian Jewish composer and instructor of the tar instrument, which is a plucked long neck lute. That's a setar, setar. not a tar, which is different. No. Correct. Okay. Um, Nedavud was one of the most outstanding performers of the tar, and he's remembered for not only training a number of the most outstanding musicians in Iran, but also um, widely respected for, he had an effort later in his life to record the entire repertoire of Persian music on his tar, over 200 pieces, um, and he refused compensation for this. He was born into a Jewish family of professional musicians, and his father was also a performer on the tombak, so he had a thirst for music at a young age, and so he really is widely respected and loved and contributed to the style of classical Persian music. So there is an event at UCLA on April 23rd honoring his music and his life, Morteza right. Nezavud, put together by Dr. Mohammadi, April right. 25th. And, and concert. And concert of music. So one of his most famous pieces is Morghe Sahar, which means, yes, yes, Morghe Sahar, the, the morning bird. Is that right? The morning bird. And um, so, and it is a, he wrote the melody for this, and the lyrics were written by somebody else. The text um, is about, Freedom. It's actually a political, social song, right? And so we will uh, use the melody for um, a prayer for peace a little bit later in our service. For now, I'd like us to turn our attention to Hashki Venu, which is also a prayer for peace in the night. And it's on page 33. And if you know the melody, I encourage you to please, I invite you to please sing along. Thirty-four and continue.
Continue with Chatzy Kaddish on page 34. our moment of private personal prayer and reflection, which begins on page 35 and continues through page 38. When you're ready, please join us in the middle of page 38.
we turn to page 48, Kaddish Shalem. Yit Kadal, Yit Kadash, Shemei Rabba, Be'alma Divra, Kirutei, V'yam Lich Malchutei, Be'chai Yachonu V'yamachonu B'chai Duchol Beit Yisrael, Be'alma, Be'agala V'zman Kari V'imru Amen, Yehei Shemei Rabba, Me'brach Lela Muma Me'amaya, it parach, pishtabach, it par, it roman, it nasse, it adal, it alev, it alash, it kudesh, abrihu, leila, min kol bechata veshirata, tush bechata venechamata, damiran, velma vimru, amen. Tit kabal selotehon, uvautehon, the whole Israel, koda mawan di vishmaya vimru. Shalom Rabba min Shammai v'chaim aleinu v'yaku Yisrael v'imru amen Ose shalom b'imromah U'yase shalom aleinu v'yaku Yisrael v'imru We just celebrated Purim on Wednesday, which happened to fall on the same day as the first day of Noruz, the Persian New Year. I've always felt very connected to Purim. Maybe it's because, as I mentioned earlier, my grandparents and everyone before them, as far as we can remember, are all from Hamadan, which is the modern day name for Shushan, where Esther and Mordechai lived. So that's right, Purim took place in the land where many of my ancestors are from. Hamadan is where the tomb of Esther and Mordechai are, and I believe there's a picture in your pamphlet of that. Maybe I feel so connected because I feel somehow I'm related to Esther. She's a great-great-grandmother. Maybe. But I think the connection goes even deeper. Maybe there is a universal theme hidden within the story of Purim that is so relatable to all of us. Purim, as many of you know, is about masks and hidden identities. Esther had to hide her identity as a Jew for fear of being killed. The name of God is not mentioned once in Megillat Esther, which has been interpreted by many to mean that God's presence and help while there were hidden. We wear masks and costumes on Purim, maybe to have fun, to add to the humor and joy of this holiday, but maybe these masks represent constant masks that we wear, parts of our identities that we hide and that we've hidden over time for centuries. There are masks on a personal level, there are masks on a global level. For me, as many of you know, I felt a calling to become a cantor for a very long time, but it was a path that I hid, both to myself and to the outside world. The self-doubt, the fear of judgment, the pressure to conform, the worry of what, if, what it would mean to break with the norm because there was such low precedent in the Persian community for a woman to become a re religious leader, a clergy person. Whatever it was, I hid that side of myself in various degrees for years. There are also masks on a global level. Th throughout the ages, in every country and region, from Persia to Spain to Europe and beyond, the Jewish people many times have been forced to mask their identities in order to survive and avoid either harassment or worse, execution. We know stories of Jews being forced to outwardly convert from forced conversions to Christianity at the time of the Spanish Inquisition to forced conversions to Islam during certain periods in Iran. And we know that many of those who outwardly converted in order to stay alive risk their lives in order to secretly continue practicing their true religion. We are experiencing a painful and frightening rise in anti-Semitism all throughout the world, including right here in the US, right here in Los Angeles. There were posters right in this neighborhood. There are hateful remarks. 
about Jews. There's the demonization of Israel, which, speaking of masks, is really just anti-Semitism wearing a mask. And we know about masks. The Torah portion this Shabbat is Tzav. Tzav teaches us something remarkable about masks. God instructs Moses regarding specific details of sacrificial worship and ritual. One specific offering mentioned is the ritual of the sacrifice of well-being. This is an elective offering. It's, you have the free will, the choice, to make this offering. And in ancient times, an individual could do it or not. If such person felt grateful or wished for some internal peace or had a prayer, this was the offering. A sacrifice for peace and well-being. When we wear masks, when we hide our true identities, we make a sacrifice that does just the opposite of bringing us peace and well-being. Masks disturb our inner peace. They cause anguish. In times of persecution, there's no choice but to wear a mask to stay alive. And it was a painful mask to wear and a sacrifice in itself. Today, removing your mask is a modern-day well-being sacrifice. You are sacrificing the old you, the one who is scared, the one who hides. You potentially sacrifice the approval or admiration of others, but the reward of removing your mask is peace and well-being, the freedom to express yourself as you are. So even though anti-Semitism and really hatred of all forms are on the rise, we live in an era and country where we can and should reveal who we are and be proud of it. So let us be like Mordechai, who didn't hide who he was, didn't hide his Judaism from Haman, and risked his life by not bowing, sticking to his values. Let us be like Esther, who was willing to sacrifice her life and her family, everything she had, to remove her mask and save her people. Shabbat Shalom. At this time, I'm honored to call up Talila Levy, another one of our dear community members who will share a personal story of her heritage. Shabbat Shalom. I want to thank Jackie for making this special Shabbat for us. My story is pre-revolution, and Tyrone's story was post-revolution, <clears throat> being Jewish in Iran. I was born in Israel to an Iraqi family. Iraq is an ancient Babylonian. But we lived in Iran during the years of the Shah. My parents escaped Iraq in 1948 and settled in Tehran along with 20,000 other Iraqi Jews. At one point, Iran's Jewish population was 200,000. Today's Jewish population is estimated to be 10,000. So it's between your number and my number. My father was a businessman, and my mom was a homemaker, raising five girls, all girls. During the time I was growing up, there was much freedom for the Jews, and I had many good memories. The government had close relations with Israel and helped Jews settle in Iran from Iraq, somewhat reminiscent of King Cyrus, who issued the decree of liberation to the Jews in ancient Persia. We lived in Tehran, which had a large Jewish community. There were many synagogues and several, several large Jewish schools. During the high holy days, the synagogues were packed. I attended one of those large Jewish schools all the way through high school. Because Jews were in Iran for several thousand years, they adopted many pre-Islamic Persian customs, such as celebrating the ancient secular Nuru's holiday listening to Persian music, and enjoying Persian food. Although Jews had freedom, we still encountered anti-Semitism. Our next-door neighbor would refuse to even drink a glass of water in our house because she would say the Jews are najes, meaning dirty Jews. Another incident I remember vividly in 1968 was a soccer match between Iran and Israel. When Israel scored a goal, a mob of Muslims attacked Jews and destroyed shops and personal properties in Jewish quarters. And during the Yom Kippur War, they distributed candy in the bazaar when the war started. As Tarane mentioned, Passover and other holidays, including Shabbat, were observed widely. 
Passover was an especially beautiful holiday in our household. Everyone in our community observed Passover, even those Jews who were not religious. All the females of our household will help in cleaning the house and baking the matzahs. There were no box matzahs in, to buy in the market. My grandmother would get up very early in the morning, the day before Passover, and boil water in a large pot. She would throw a burning hot stone in the boiling pot. Afterwards, she would cashier all of our pots, pans, plates, and utensils to make them fit for Passover. I left Tehran the day of the Shah's departure in 1979 during the Islamic Revolution. I went to England and then came to U.S., but my, my family remained in Iran for several years. My mother and my two sisters were able to escape Iran and went to Israel for a few years. My father was unable to leave Iran at that time and took him four years more until he could sneak out and be reunited with the family. During his stay in Iran, my father offered refuge to a few Israelis that remained in Iran in our house until the Israeli security was able to rescue them. Today, life for the remaining Jews in Iran is mixed. Some who are living there have much difficulty, and yet others manage with few problems. They obviously cannot openly support Israel, even the one Jewish representative in the Majlis, the parliament, is forced to condemn Israel. Although today's Iran has a relatively large secular population, and different, is different from the Arab states, anti-Semitism in many ways has been institutionalized by the mullahs. The Jewish communities in the various cities are very small. They have mohels, ritual slaughterers, Jewish schools, and although some synagogues have been closed, some remain open. Most people observe Judaism even more strangely than in the times of the Shah. The Jewish school that I attended is now an all-girl Muslim school, although it is interesting to note that the school synagogue remains. I, like my Persian Jewish friends, are grateful to live in an America and do not take our freedoms for granted. I hope to one day return and visit a peaceful and free Iran. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much for sharing that beautiful story. I know we are a little over time. We're going to wrap up our service in just a few minutes. I ask you to please rise for the Kiddush, which is on page, begins actually on page 47, one paragraph, and goes to page 49, the Persian Sephardic version. This is a Persian that, this is a version um, that my family, my dad, leads for us every Friday night. I'm going to try it. Sorry, dad, if I do it wrong. <laughs> יום השישי ויחו לו השמיים והארץ וחוץ ועם ויחל אלוהים ביום השביעי מלאכתו אשר עשה וישפוט ביום השביעי מכל מלאכתו אשר עשה ויברך אלוהים את יום השביעי ויקדש אותו כי יבוא שבת מכל מלאכתו אשר בר אלוהים לעשות סברי מר ענן ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם בורא פרי הגפן ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר קידשנו במצוותיו ורצבנו ושבת קודשו באהבה ורצון הנחתנו זיכרון למעשה וראשית כי הוא יום תחילה למקראי קודש זכר ליציאת מצרים כיוונו ואחרת ואותנו קידשת מכל העמים ושבת קודשו באהבה וברצון הנחתנו ברוך אתה אדוני מקדש השבת We continue with Alenu. We invite up our young leaders once again to lead us in Alenu, which is on page 51. A quick Alenu. Come on up, Jake. You'll lead us. As Jake is coming up, tonight is a, is a Persian Jewish service, but it's also not very traditional because, as you know, in a Persian synagogue, a woman wouldn't be leading the prayers in a traditional Persian synagogue. There wouldn't be instruments, and there wouldn't be any Ashkenazi prayer books, and there wouldn't be an Ashkenazi uh, 
It's melody like this. However, we are a joined, we are a community that comes together, and it's so beautiful to share our traditions and to blend them together and remember that we are all part of a larger community and all of humanity, in fact, is connected through music and song and prayer. So we have our young leaders who will lead us in Alenu. Alenu leshabeach ladon hakol To Betoratecha, Adonaim Lach, Lelam, Vaed, Vememan, Rehaya, Adonai, Vememan, Alcola. Mourner's Kaddish, page 52. All those in mourning observing a yard site remain standing. We recall those in our community whose yard site occurred this week. Jenny Berman, Irene Ann Karabet, Julia Freund, Bial Goodman, Harry Jenner, Alma Levy, Jane Link, Bernard Passy, Isidore Singer, Betty Nemeroff Sufrin, my grandfather Yehuda Rafi. Any additional names to add? <laughs> May their memories be for a blessing. Winner's Cottage, page 52. Yitkadal v'itkadash shemei rabba ve'alma divra kirute ve'amlich malchute v'chai echon v'yom echon v'chaiye d'chol b'yit Yisrael v'agala v'izman kariv v'imru amen Yehei shemei rabba mevarach le'alam u'lalmei almaya Yitbarach v'ishtabach v'itpa'ar v'itromam v'itnase v'itadar v'itale v'italal shemei d'kudsha b'richu Le'ela min kol berchata v'shirata, tushpechata v'nechamata, damiran be'alma v'imru, amen. Yehei shalom araba min shemaya, v'chayim aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael v'imru, amen. Ose shalom b'imromav, hu ya'ase shalom, aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael v'imru, amen. You may be seated. We continue now with announcements. Um, I'd like to thank so many people who helped make this evening happen for the first time ever. Um, our wonderful musicians who are here, Ava Nahas on percussion. Jenny Asher on violin. You might remember her from Songstruck. Also someone you might remember from Songstruck, Daniel Reichman on guitar. I want to thank 
Dr. Mohammad Mohammadi for joining us with his beautiful sitar. I want to thank the Bakshi family for leading that beautiful prayer. Tarane and Talila, thank you so much for sharing your beautiful stories. Our adult choir, Roma, Levi, Oferho, our special guest, Hazan Joel Smith and Cantor Ron Snow for lending their voices. <laughs> Cantor Ron Snow, who managed all of the sound for this evening and is sitting there and is responsible for the way we sound. Um, our Shomri Torah maintenance team, Porf, David, and Jeremy, who helped set up. Thank you so much. And I want to give a special thank you to our Persian Shabbat committee. You see these beautiful decor here, um, and you'll see more in the in raffle hall. Those of you who are joining us for dinner, um, they contributed so much time and help and um, energy, and I thank them so much. Tarana Benafsheha, Parveen Benun, Kathy Amin, Vida Bakshi, Sigalid Moradi, and Talila Levy. Um, we have also more volunteers who helped us today. Um, Sue Moss helped lead the volunteer effort. Thank you so much, Sue. Gil. Ellie Emanuel showed up early. Thank you to my mom for creating the half scene that you'll see in Raffle Hall. And I especially want to thank you all so much for being here to share in this cultural experience, to open yourselves to hearing a new tradition, and for helping us bring these melodies to life. And if uh, those of you who are staying for dinner, please join us in Raffle Hall next door. One more thing. Yes. A special thanks to the lady whose vision this was. Thank you. <laughs> we will conclude our service um, by inviting again Dr. Mohammadi up for Osa Shalom to Morga Sahar, which will then lead us into an upbeat conclusion.
proceeding, thank you to Seth Grant. 